United States Congressman Gerald Nadler, a Democrat from New York. Mr. Nadler has been a big proponent of the public option. He joins us from the ABC News studio here in New York. Also with us is Michael Tanner, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Mr. Tanner does not believe a public health option would help most Americans get better health care. He joins us from the ABC News Bureau in Washington, D.C. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. And Michael, let's start with you. There are a lot of polls out there, but they show that about 65% of Americans want a public insurance option as a voluntary alternative. Why do you think this is a bad idea? Well, because it's being sold as voluntary choice competition, but the reality is that it's not going to be optional. Uh, the reality is this is being set up in a way that for many people, they're going to be dumped into this public option against their will and they're not going to have any choice in the matter and ultimately down the road this is going to lead to a complete government takeover of the health care system congressman nadler you wrote an open letter on health insurance reform saying the opposition has orchestrated a massive coordinated campaign of disinformation and lies designed to intimidate us with talking of mythical death panels euthanasia and socialized medicine can you further elaborate on this well you just heard uh, a, a series of that some of that misinformation from mr tanner thirty seconds ago um, the the proposal is for a public option which is just that an option People who do not get the health insurance from their employers, small business people, unemployed people, will be able to buy insurance on an exchange, which is a government regulated market, and they can buy it from any number of private insurance companies on the exchange or from a public option, which will be one available option on the exchange. Nobody's going to be dumped into it. Uh, that's just uh, fear mongering. Well, that, that's simply not the way the real world's going to work. The fact is that this government run option is ultimately guaranteed by the taxpayers. It is supported by taxpayers who will bail it out in the event it loses money. Therefore, well, that's not true either. The, the, the public option is specifically set up to be dependent only on premiums that it will charge, with the single exception that it will have some startup money to get it started, which it'll, it'll have to repay over a number of years. And that's but there'll what be no, about but there'll be no, no ongoing government subsidies whatsoever. The yeah. only government subsidies are to individuals, whether they're in the public option or private companies who can't afford to buy uh, any insurance. Now, that, that's what we said about Fannie and Freddie, too, that there wouldn't be any government bailout. <coughs> we know that in a world in which we're bailing out banks and auto companies, that if the public option were to lose money, you're not about to sit there, Congressman, and say, oh, well, we tried it, guess it goes bankrupt, let it go out of business. The fact is, you're going to come in with taxpayer money the and bail it the out. The fact is, there is no reason to expect the public option to lose money at all. It should provide real competition for the monopolistic uh, private insurance companies. The fact is, um, and either this, what I'm about to say is true or not. If it's not true, the public option will collapse. But the fact is, public health insurance has proven to be much more efficient than the private health insurance. Uh, the overhead cost for private health insurance in this country varies between 15 and, and uh, 35 percent. Medicare, it's 2 to 3 percent. Uh, when I say overhead, I mean anything not spent specifically on, 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 on provision of services. So we expect that the public option will be more efficient and therefore will provide competition to hold down the costs uh, and better the services of the private uh, insurance companies, which is the whole purpose. If it doesn't happen, then people won't opt to get into it. Well, I I if it's actually going to compete, it's going to have many of these same costs that private insurance now is going to have. It's going to have to market itself, and if it's going to avoid the fraud and abuse that goes on in Medicare, which even the president talks about, then it's going to have to increase its administrative costs, and it's not going to be competitive on that basis. The reason it's going to be competitive is because it's backed up ultimately by the taxpayers, because it's not subject to state lawsuits, unlike traditional insurance plans, that it's not going to have many of the same taxes that it's going to have to pay as private insurance plans and so on. It's going to have a number of unfair advantages. That means it's going to be cheaper. That means businesses are going to have an incentive to dump their workers into this public option. And gentlemen, we're getting a lot of tweets in on this topic, uh, no surprise. Uh, Joe Heal says the welfare of its people is the government's job. It doesn't matter if it's over civil liberties or health care. Would one of you care to respond to that tweet? Well, I'm not sure what he means by the civil liberties, but he's right. Uh, ultimately, the job of government is to provide for the common wealth, for the, for, the, for the overall welfare that's in the preamble to the Constitution. And the fact of the matter is that, uh, frankly, that, that uh, 
the, the gentle administration of, the, of private insurance companies has left us in a situation where they treat the American people like dirt, where, uh, where people uh, who get sick after having paid their insurance premiums for years are suddenly uh, told they don't have an insurance uh, uh, policy anymore, they're rescinded, where uh, 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 you, you can't get insurance if you've ever been sick before. And uh, this bill is going to say that we're no longer going to allow rescissions by insurance companies. We're no longer going to allow uh, discrimination on the basis of sex or, 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 or gender or, uh, previous, uh, 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 or, or previous illness. We're no longer going to allow uh, out-of-pocket expenses uh, that are unlimited. We're going to say that you can't have, no matter what out-of-pocket expenses you have, they, no matter how sick you are, they can't exceed $5,000 for an individual per year. We're going to have no more lifetime uh, uh, limits so that if you get really sick suddenly you go bankrupt. You know, 55% uh, of the bankruptcies in this country, the personal bankruptcies in this country are for medical care or because of someone got sick and 75% of those people, 75% of the people go bankrupt because of medical uh, uh, bills have or thought they had adequate insurance. That's going to be over with this. President Obama uh, doesn't believe that a dime will be added to the deficit on this. Is, is that realistic? How much do you think we will end up spending? on this reform system? Well, the, the reality is that this bill is going to add to the deficit. It gets away with it sort of by using some statistical or some budgetary flim-flam of moving $250 billion in money necessary to avoid Medicare reimbursement cuts next year off budget or off into a separate bill. Sort of it's like being able to say that your household budget is fine as long as you can take your mortgage and your car payment and pay them somewhere else. Well, that's a distortion, too. The neutral uh, uh, that most people cite as, as um, uh, uh, accurate and, and the umpire and, and, and costs is the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, and the Congressional Budget Office said that an earlier version of this bill would add to the deficit. It says that this bill will reduce the deficit uh, by $30 billion over uh, 10 years. And if you count the uh, Class Act, which is in the latest version of the bill, which uh, provides for long-term uh, insurance care on a voluntary basis will reduce the budget, the deficit rather, by over $100 billion but, in 10 but years. Con Congressman, but Congressman, don't, the don't you move $250 billion to, to that in dot fix to, to a separate to, bill that's that, not paid for? I'll come to that in 10 seconds. CBO says it will reduce the budget deficit by $30 billion or $100 billion, depending on how you count the Class Act, in 10 years and further in the next 10 years. Now, what Mr. Uh, Tanner is doing is a little sleight of hand here. The Republicans put in a provision in the law, uh, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, uh, that said that if certain savings weren't going to occur in Medicare, which we knew wouldn't occur, then you were going to reduce the uh, uh, reimbursement rates to doctors drastically. That has never been allowed to happen. Congress has postponed that annually. And whether we pass medical health insurance or not, we are going to not permit that to happen. So it'll cost about 200, 240 billion, I think, over 10 years to prevent that from happening. But that's not that is not going to be permitted to happen. We're going to spend that 200 or 240 billion dollars, whether we do the health care bill uh, or any health care reform or not. So it is not properly a cost of the health care reform. It's a cost of the general government. Well, and it's also not paid for. So it's going to add 250 yes, billion dollars to the yes, debt. Yes, that is correct. That is going to add 240 billion dollars over 10 years to the deficit, with or without the health care bill. But the question is the health care bill, and that will uh, reduce the deficit by either 30 billion or over 100 billion dollars, depending how you count the class act, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Michael, do you think that health care will be compromised, taken to a lower standard for millions of Americans with this plan? Well, I think certainly. I, I, I think that you are making promises under this bill that can't be kept in terms of the quality of health care. And all you have to do is look to the health care systems the government runs today. Does anyone really want to be on Medicaid? It provides low quality care at a high cost. Now, Medicare does a little bit better, but it's also between 50 and 100 trillion dollars in debt, depending on which program you want to you want to argue about or uh, which accounting measure. Uh, we're going to make cuts to Medicare. This bill makes $500 billion in cuts to Medicare. Now, I think many of those cuts are probably justified, but they're clearly going to reduce the services that seniors get under this bill. Well, I, again, a bunch of distortions. That we are not going to reduce any services that seniors get under this bill, number one. Number two, Medicare is not trillions of dollars in debt. Um, Medicare 
the costs of Medicare have been going up about 4.4 percent a year. The costs of health care generally have been going up 7 point something percent a year. So Medicare has actually been doing a better job at holding down costs than, than private health care in, insurance. And look at the rate at which health care insurance, private insurance premiums have been going up. Um, so Medicare is doing a pretty good job. And yes, you know, almost 45 or 46 percent of the population of this country now gets government medical care. Medicare, Medicaid, and the Veterans Administration. And I think most people think they do a pretty good job, better than the private insurance companies do. Well, first of all, the numbers I quoted for Medicare's unfunded liabilities are from the trustees of, uh, of, the, of the Medicare That's an unfunded liability that's not a debt. And an unfunded liability is a promise is, you've made that you can't keep. No, it's a promise as that, 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 that looks forever. I mean, I don't know how, over what period of time you're talking about. It looks forever. It's the same thing that says that Social Security has trillions which of unfunded is. liabilities, which it does not. Which Social it Security absolutely is, Congressman. You, well, you can't promise things and not have the money to have, pay for we, them. We've done we that have, for far too long. We will be able to, no, it is tr first of all, Social Security is in fine shape. Uh, contrary to what Mr. Tanner says all the time, he's the fellow who wanted to privatize Social Security, abolish Medicare, and, and now he wants not to have the public option or health care. He's consistent, at least. He doesn't, think in, he doesn't believe in any government program. We should all be at the mercy of the insurance companies uh, for, for, for old age and for everything else. But the fact of the matter is that Medicare, unlike Social Security, does have a problem that we're going to have to deal with. We have to cut the, uh, the, in, the rate of increase in costs. But as I said, that's not a Medicare-specific problem. It's a health care problem overall, because we are not going to be able to, to afford uh, health care uh, cost increase at the rate it's growing, uh, whether with a public option or with this bill or not. And as I said, Medicare is doing a better job now at, co at containing costs than the private sector is. Um, but we're going to have to do a better job overall generally, with or without well, any change that we're making now. Sure. And, and, I, and I agree with that, actually. I think the Republicans are being somewhat shameless in decrying the Medicare cuts that are in this bill because they're going to have to make those cuts. But the cuts are there. There's reductions in reimbursements for imaging services. That's going to result in fewer imaging uh, services, fewer MRIs and CAT bands and so on being taken. There's a reduction, there's a penalty for doctors that prescribe in the 90th percentile or above in terms of procedures done. There's cuts in the Medicare Advantage program that's going to cut back on well, the, the number cuts, of Medicare one, Advantage policies thing that would, are done. The one thing I would agree with you is the Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage is being cut and properly so. It is the only uh, real cut as opposed to, well, for instance, what he was referring to a moment ago. Right now, if you go to a, 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 a doctor and he says you get a CAT scan, they'll pay for the CAT scan, and that's proper. Uh, and then they say, well, you need, to show, you need to see a specialist. We'll pay for the specialist. That's fine, too. And then the specialist says you need a, you need a CAT scan. You get a second CAT scan because he doesn't refer back to the first because of medical duplication. We're go there's a lot in this bill to try to reduce costs through eliminating that kind of duplication, not through eliminating necessary CAT scans or any other, t or, or, or any other test. The Medicare Advantage is, in, is, is interesting because the Medicare Advantage was something that the Republicans put in again about 10 years ago. It started off before then, but in this modern form about 10 years ago, in which they said, you can sign up in Medicare instead of with the, with the old Medicare system, which is what most people still have, but is the is government provision of uh, government payment for services, for private services. You can sign up with a private uh, insurance company in Medicare. The government will give a certain amount to the private insurance company because they claimed it would be cheaper and the government it would only cost 95 percent of what it would if, if you did the normal government route. In fact, we are now giving the private insurance companies 114 percent for each patient who signs up instead of uh, what they ought to be getting, which is under 100%. So we're going to reduce that to 100% to stop the profiteering by the uh, Medicare Advantage companies. And yes, some people who are getting some services at the expense of other Medicare people are, are, are not going to get them. Um, That's right. Because one, one most of five seniors is on Medicare because, Advantage. Because most of the Medicare Advantage extra 15 or 14% or goes to profits of the insurance companies. And that but should never have happened in the first place. There should be a, a single standard. And if we're going to increase the benefits of Medicare, we should do it across the board, not just for people, not by extra subsidies uh, to private insurance companies. If the insurance companies could do what they said they would, which is provide these extra services for the same amount that Medicare was paying, or for 95% of what Medicare is paying, that was the promise, that was the experiment, it's failed.
Well, the fact is, seniors who are now getting vision care and dental care and other things through these Medicare Advantage programs are going to lose those benefits. But I have a question for the Congressman. If what he really wants is competition for the insurance industry, instead of creating a government monopoly in there, why not simply open up insurance to uh, competition from all 1,300 insurers there are, uh, allow people to buy health insurance in any state in the union, allow well, his constituents in New York to go online to eSurance, find the cheapest policy there, there is and buy it. Why should they be locked in to extremely high New York insurance rates? Well, first of all, we're not creating a government monopoly. We're creating a government option, as I said before. <laughs> but second of all, um, anyone today can buy from any insurance company in the country they want to. The problem is that insurance companies, or the, I wouldn't say the problem, the, 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 the limiting factor is that various states have uh, certain protections for people that some other states don't. And if you want to sell insurance in New York, you have to follow New York law. If you want to sell insurance in New Jersey, you have to follow New Jersey law. But plenty of people in New York buy insurance from companies based in other states if they choose to adhere to the New York uh, uh, protections, pr consumer protections. Well, the, now, in this bill, in this bill, what we are doing makes it five or six doing, times more expensive doing, than other are, states. Well, maybe, uh, although I don't think that's true. But that's an issue for the New York legislature and the voters in New York. Well, or it's we're an doing interstate in the, commerce issue doing, for the Congress. What we're doing, what we're doing in this bill. Uh, in the new version of the bill, we're addressing that problem by allowing states to make agreements with each other that will permit um, them to waive, in effect, their, con their protections uh, if they want to, um, so that uh, uh, some company that's, that's using uh, Washington state law can use Washington state law in New York if New York agrees. Uh, well, gentlemen, that's a we step have in another the right direction. Sir, if you right. wanted to finish your thought, I was just going to bring in another I was going to say, tweet. that's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. There are some 1,300 insurance companies in the U.S., 40% of which are nonprofits. Why don't we just open up to widespread competition? Because what we have found, and we, we do, they can all compete, but what we have found is that, and the various states have enacted various consumer protections, uh, community rating, other things that uh, they have found necessary over the years to protect people from from rate gouging, uh, from lousy service, from whatever. And or their I don't think interest. I don't think Congress yeah. ought to overturn uh, the states. The states are the laboratories of democracy, and if people think that the, the consumer protections are needed, that's fine. And if they think that they're overbearing and, and making insurance too too uh, expensive, then they should talk to their state legislators. Well, you, call, like these consumer, okay. you call these consumer protections. In many cases, these are simply special interest legislation to guarantee coverage for certain provider groups or disease constituencies. And this is clearly a question well, of when interstate you say to guarantee uh, coverage. commerce. Well, when you see to guarantee coverage, I would hope that uh, uh, if you have health insurance, you're guaranteed if you're a woman over 40 to, get a ma to have a mammogram covered. I would hope that... Uh, uh, if you think you have good insurance and you find that you have cancer, they don't say we don't cover cancer. Well, so these, some of these, these added some insurance of these, add cost. I mean, you're not getting have, them for they free. They may add costs, but people who who pay through Wasn't the nose that their for choice. But people who pay through the nose for insurance should know it. Should 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 be getting decent insurance, and it's the job of state legislatures to protect their people. That's why they're elected. And if you think you're being overprotected, uh, vote for a different state legislator. Okay, clearly so much to debate here. Um, we have another tweet, <laughs> uh, Jody N. Columbus. Health insurance does not work. Just beef up the free clinic system. That way, there is a public option for all and no billing problems. Any thoughts on that? Well, in the latest version of this bill, we are doubling, I think, uh, I'm not sure it's doubling, but it's very substantially increasing the funds for community health centers. I certainly agree community health centers are a major uh, positive factor in this country, and we're, we're certainly increasing funding for that in this bill. Well, the Congressman and I have an area of agreement there. There are several studies out there that suggest that for the marginal dollar of spending on health care, there's no evidence that insurance is the best way to spend that dollar. That in many cases, other things such as community health centers are a better, more effective way to spend the money than simply giving people a piece of paper that says they have insurance. Okay, final thoughts. Congressman Nadler, is this going to pass? I think it'll pass. I think some version of this will pass. I, I, I hope, uh, you know, we have a lot of very good things in the House bill. Uh, the Senate bill, from my point of view, isn't nearly as good. I hope the final product um, is as good. And uh, Michael, how bad do you think this will be for America if it passes? Well, I think this would be a hugely expensive bill that's going to increase taxes for America, increase their insurance premiums, and diminish their quality of care. I'm not so sure it's going to pass. The Democrats still have to find a way to agree on everything from how to pay for a bill that's going to cost more than a trillion dollars, to whether or not they're going to have a mandate that's going to raise taxes on the middle class, to whether or not they're going to have this public option, which I think is going to really drive private insurance out of business.
And uh, Congressman Nadler, I just have one more question for you. House Democrats last week unveiled their bill, as we know, to remake the health care system. Republicans say gimmicks were used to hide the measure's long-term costs. Well, that's not true. The, uh, it, it's very hard to hide long-term costs these days with the Congressional Budget Office on the job and, and any number of private uh, groups looking at it. And we've published this bill well in advance, so all whatever number of pages in it, people can go through every comment in it. And again, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, the, which is the neutral, uh, nonpartisan agency, says that this bill, uh, contrary to Mr. Tanner, over the 10 years will reduce the deficit by $30 billion. And if you include the CLASS Act, which is the uh, long-term care provision of the bill that was just added, will reduce, it by over, uh, will reduce the budget by over $100 billion and more in the, uh, in the, ten year, in, in the, in the, in the second 10 years. So it will reduce the deficit. Um, and as for paying for it, um, it's not going to increase taxes for all people. It's going to increase taxes for something like three-tenths of one percent of people, namely those people who earn, whose income is over half a million dollars for an individual or a million dollars for a couple. If your income is over a million dollars for you and your wife, yes, your taxes will be increased by 5.4 percent. Okay. If it's not, well, Congressman we won't, Nadler, an insurance mandate, we're going to have to stop you there, gentlemen. I'm sorry. We're, that's all we have to time for Summers. today. Obviously a very hotly contested debate here. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. And